all of you. This is the panel for Revitalizing Economic Growth. I'm Akiko Fujita, and it is great to be able to moderate what is really a timely discussion, uh, looking at the global macro picture as we come up on the last month of the year. And some of the key themes we're really hoping to tackle this time around is trying to hone in on what's playing out across the Asia Pacific region. Uh, certainly, I'm based in New York City, where things have been much worse as it relates to infection numbers for the coronavirus, which has in turn led to sort of a slowdown in the economic recovery. But in many ways, APAC region certainly kind of a, the, the model citizen, if you will, um, throughout this pandemic. Uh, some key issues we're hoping to tackle today. What are the key challenges that Asian economies are going to face moving forward? And then, of course, what are the policy options to inspire economic recovery? And, and thankfully, we've got a great panel today, uh, a very diverse group of voices. We've got Stanley Lowe, who's the chief executive officer of World Capacity Builders, and Nelder, who is the Ch uh, CEO of Small Business Association of Australia. Australia. Uh, Jonathan Savier, who is the CEO and co-founder of Quinkus, he's based in Singapore. We've also got Nicholas Johnson, who is the CEO of Economics Without Borders, and Nalima uh, Parisker. I hope I got that right, Nalima, president and CEO of Snap IT Solutions. Uh, she is based here in the U.S. alongside me. Um, Nicholas, I'd love to kick things off with you because you are, I believe, the lone economist on our panel. Um, to take a look at where things stand right now in the region, you know, it, it, it has been unprecedented when you look at the last six, seven months in terms of just the amount of stimulus that governments around the world have poured into this, given the sudden economic stop that we had early on. As you look across the Asia Pacific region, what are you seeing in, from this side, it feels like things are moving a lot more quicker than they are in places like the US or Europe. Absolutely. Um, so really the um, awful economic situation that we see unfolding um, that we have seen unfolding this year is probably going to continue for the next six to 12 months, at least, at least the ramifications of that. And um, really the same uh, impacts can be seen in most countries because, you know, the majority of countries in the world have um, implemented lockdowns to various degrees and they have also um, put in place um, uh, fiscal stimulus measures to help support a lot of the people who have lost their jobs. And so, well, the, what are the economic ramifications of this? So, you know, a lot of the industries in the APAC region, which um, were dependent on in-person engagement, so we're talking about the tourism industry, the hospitality and food services industries, these have been broadly wiped out. They've been hit hardest, I think. And they um, are still really struggling now, even as the lockdowns begin to ease. Um, some of the knowledge sectors have fared relatively better because people have been able to work remotely. And so um, while we still wait uh, a vaccine to be uh, released and, um, and put into place worldwide to allow the widespread you know, reintroduction of travel, I think we're sort of seeing a few um, uh, things take place that are gonna shape what the economy in the APAC region looks like for the next five, 10 years. So first of all, we have the um, reallocation of capital to um, industries which are either in the tech sector or in sectors which support the, um, the, the um, decentralization of the workforce. Okay, so some of the trends we're already seeing around working from home and automation, um, these have been accelerated, if you like. So we have, we've seen five years of progress take place in the space of one year. Um, I think there are a lot of, and, and that, that's, that's more of a structural shift, if you like, in the economy. That's a structural, and that, that will be a permanent shift, I believe. There are some also some, uh, there are some more temporary shifts. Uh, so if we look at the impact on economic growth, so obviously that has taken a hit in nearly every country in the world in the last 12 months. And it'll probably take two or three years, according to our model estimations, before that returns to the sort of um, trend trajectory which we would have predicted last year. Um, we're seeing high unemployment, but there's a difference between the official unemployment figures in most countries and the effective unemployment figures. And the reason is because 
um, the official unemployment figures are lower than they actually should be because there's a lot of government stimulus and mm -hmm. um, short-term temporary um, welfare put in place just to support um, these displaced workers. So, for instance, in Australia, we have um, the the Job Seeker program and the Job Keeper program, and the Job Maker program, which the federal government has put in place. You know, just to give funding between six and 12 months to businesses and people who've lost their jobs mm -hmm. um, or lost the ability to bring in revenue. When that, when that disappears, uh, you know, in Australia, but also in other countries, there's going to be a bit of a, a bit of a, a shift, yeah. right? There'll be a, a cliff mm -hmm. at which point unemployment figures will probably revert to where mm -hmm. they should be. And also there's going to be reallocation of capital as businesses, which maybe should have collapsed earlier, will, um, uh, yeah. will finally close down. And so, so I think, yes. Let, let, let me try to sort of, sort of break that apart here because uh, there's there's a number of things that I think um, we can sort of break apart given who's on our panel. But, you know, you talked about the very beginning about some of these areas that have been especially hit hard, uh, those who are reliant on tourism. And, and, and I think that's sort of that cue to you because you deal with small businesses. You're on the Gold Coast. Um, you certainly, in our conversations, talked about how um, – Things have looked good where you are from the health side relatively compared to what is playing out globally. But from the business side, small businesses have really just been hit hard. And you think it's a long road to recovery. Walk us through what specifically you're hearing on the ground there. Well, bis small businesses make up about 97, 98 percent of uh, businesses in Australia. So, so my area is small business. Um, the tourism sector, which the Gold Coast is the capital of tourism in Australia, besides other industries, uh, it has suffered very badly simply because we had our borders closed for, uh, for quite a while. Many of them have opened up. There are some that are still closed. And, of course, we have lost our international travel uh, people. So that's created a huge amount. It's caused hundreds of millions of dollars in losses. So that has affected the small business owner. Now, the government has, to its credit, brought in a number of schemes to assist business owners, but a lot of businesses failed to be able to take up those offers because they, they didn't comply or there's some sort of a glitch there where they could not get those benefits. So in reality, as Nicholas has said, we... Um, our official unemployment rates are actually much, much higher than what they are being broadcast. Um, domestic tourism, uh, since they've opened up the borders, is assisting a great deal. And we are expecting on the Gold Coast to have a, a very, very, uh, hopefully a very good year because uh, the New South Wales and Victorian borders have either opened up or is about to open up. So that means millions of, uh, like millions of people can have access to the Gold Coast. So that'll help a great deal. But where the problem lies, and this is much deeper, although businesses may be able to make up the revenue or earn revenue now, you've got to also try and understand in what position do they come from? Because for months and months and months, they were closed, those businesses. They still had fixed Many of them still had fixed um, expenses. Uh, those exp no revenue, so those expenses have mounted up. Many people were able to, and businesses were able to defer their bank loans, for example, but all and rents, uh, you know, leases. But all of those things have to be repaid at once at some stage. So that's where the big challenge will be. Uh, there are mixed messages coming out, not only for Queensland but for Australia overall. On the government side, it looks quite, um, it looks very encouraging, and I hope it's correct because we are a resilient country. But other surveys paint a different picture, and I've always said that I believe by about uh, April, March, April, thereabouts of next year, we will get a truer indication of where we are heading. For example, the job maker scheme that the government has brought in, well, that's going to exclude about 60% of small businesses due to the requirements in that. So it's going, it's going to help big businesses more than small businesses. And these are all the challenges that we have to face. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it's uh, whilst I'm cautiously optimistic, and we have to be, and we provide services and training and a whole range of other things, to help small business owners, I think a truer picture 
uh, will be seen next year because yeah. we, we have to see what happens over the Christmas period, which is that traditionally our uh, peak trading period. And it's businesses during this period that will make a decision whether they want to continue on or to close shop. And that's why I say it's too early yet to judge what's going on. Yeah, it, it does feel like there's there's a real sense of a lot of businesses, I, I think regardless of which country you're in, this holiday season is when they're sort of hanging on and there's a reassessment that's going to happen um, come January. Uh, Stanley, I wonder if I can bring you into the conversation. Um, you obviously focus on, on the Malaysian market. You have said that the government stimulus certainly hasn't been significant enough. Can you give us a little more color on what you're observing there? And to Anne's point, what does next year look, look like, you think, at least in Q1 or Q2, given what has played out so far? Well, Malaysia is reliant on Chinese tourists, and that border is closed, so much so that the one-star to the three-star hotels are in real distress. And the government is considering coming up with another act similar to the 1998 act called the Danahata Act, to get capital to buy up hotel rooms. They're talking about buying 20,000, 30,000, one to three star rooms to be assets of the government. And they, they will leverage those rooms to induce domestic travel first. That's, that's the plan that we're talking about at this time how successful we are able to get that capital to buy up those rooms and negotiate with the, the owners of those rooms who are basically banks, negotiate to have this asset and offer it at a reduced price to tourists in Malaysia. That's, that's one of the things that we're working on. I mean, well, what's the sense, though? If you're trying to spur domestic travel, do people really want to get out? Is it, I mean, I guess that's the question, you know, until the vaccine well, comes yeah. to market, how many people are actually yeah. really wanting to take that risk right now, especially just um, given the warnings, the health warnings that are out they, there? They're free now to go from state to state. Um, not, not these last few weeks, but before that, they could do that. Yeah. But now there's an escalation of cases. It's all shut down. Mm. But we have to prepare for the future, yes. And Jonathan, um, you know, speaking of stimulus, I mean, you're, you're sort of in this unique position. You're based in Singapore. Mm. You've obviously seen how the Singaporean government has moved. But also just being this tech company that really has helped a lot of these logistics players digitize. You've also seen the, the flow of trade pick up again. I mean, if you look at... What has played out so far this year? What would you say is the fundamental shift that you think is happening right now? And again, the ultimate question is, what does this all lead to? Right. I, I think it's actually leading to a deeper schism between large businesses and smaller businesses. And, and here's why. The, the larger businesses, and, and predominantly those that have digitized, um, are benefiting, right? Because for them, the, the move to go, you know, work remotely, for them, the, the processes that are digital is, is actually a natural move to then fully become a digital world and, and, and manage that. Um, so when we see, you know, big e-commerce is uh, benefiting to some extent uh, from that, or at least being resilient uh, and sufficiently resilient to it. The smaller businesses, however, and, and particularly those that have not been digitizing, um, those are, are obviously going through through struggles. And, and I think we're seeing a fundamental shift of those businesses trying to digitize as fast as possible. And, and we're seeing that as well, where economic activity has, has been, st well, uh, so e-commerce activity has, has, has certainly been resilient. And we're seeing that also through our, our flows in, in the business. Um, but then the small businesses, those that are digitizing are benefiting. And we're seeing that also through grants that are given, for instance, by the Singapore government to accelerate those shifts uh, towards digitization. And, and Singapore is in a unique position to be able to do this, to give grants out for digitization, for accelerating this, because their belief is also that we do our, we are looking at a different world post-COVID. Um, and and for the rest, I think Singapore has been fairly resilient as well in, in being able to maintain that. 
but you know, fully realizing that it is in a very unique position to be able to control its economy fairly well, uh, and and in and, and even though in a, in a global world. Yeah, although Singapore also very reliant on on China, and they have taken the hit at least in the initial months as a result of that. Um, Nalima, let me bring you into the conversation. You know, Jonathan was just talking about sort of this divide that we're seeing between the big and the small increasingly. Um, you know, in many ways that translates into the workforce too. And, and you're kind of in this interesting spot because while you've seen the digital acceleration in the U.S., um, we, and I say we because I'm also based in the U.S., are, are not even close to, to seeing the other side of this pandemic, largely because we haven't been able to control it in the way Australia has or Singapore has. As you look to the shift that's happening in the workforce, what does that fundamental shift look like? And, and how do you prepare for that knowing that um, there are these surges that are going to continue with these infections so long as the vaccine is not available on a very wide scale. Absolutely. Um, so my work has been predominantly trying to reach out into the communities that have underrepresented and underserved over many decades to bring them into higher tech and uh, growing tech uh, fields. So that model has been actually designed to solve a city's problem two years back that slowly started morphing into, um, you know, I was put on the state board for Kansas workforce uh, by our governor because she wanted me to look at how do I make this change more um, throughout the uh, state, um, uh, statewide changes. And when pandemic hit, hit us, we now are looking at multiple states expanding in the this kind of a model into different um, aspects of our uh, economy, bringing in the right kind of tools, bringing in the right kind of partnerships. But nobody can be prepared for what we are about to face and are facing and about to face. It's really difficult to even predict where, we'll, where we will land. But what we are actually doing is we've separated our activities into four different segments. And we looked at health uh, related tech. We looked at education that's related to workforce development. And we looked at um, uh, schools, uh, more pre uh, workforce. And of course, we looked at small businesses. And now we are looking at a at an aspect of using the stimulus funds that are coming from CARES Act, just the our state of Kansas, the Kansas state, received about $1.15 billion uh, this year uh, in March to be spent on three different pieces. We utilize that funds, one primarily to go towards healthcare and our need, um, elders and kids and young younger uh, population who are susceptible to this uh, virus. And then the second phase, we did use those funds or rethought our processes and said, how do we make our systems and our work, uh, work with and our small businesses more resilient um, and anti-fragile? But then the tools that we are trying to bring, it takes at least a year to even get to these small businesses, get to the people who are out of uh, employment at this point. Uh, unfortunate part, uh, whether it is fortunate or unfortunate, uh, most of the uh, unemployed uh, people on the unemployment benefits are at times receiving more than when they were actually working. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is there is not much incentive for us to for them to get out in this pandemic atmosphere to find a job um and you know so there is a lot more thought process and a lot more um you know uh, initiatives programs that we are building in first is to aware to bring the awareness someday or the other that money will run out you got to take care of your you know, mm -hmm. uh, go back into the jobs. The second part is how do we reutilize those tools that we can scale in huge numbers? Um, though, and speaking about Snap ID, we used to do um, in person training because it's really difficult for giving uh, this training any otherwise. 
Mm -hmm. Pandemic hit, our trainings got a huge hit. We went from training 100 people in three months to less than 20 people. Hmm. And that started dropping. But then when we pivoted our model to virtual in, uh, virtual in um, trainings, we, we could actually start training students across different states. So in a way, pivoting a model for small business and able to look at different tools and technologies, reach out and help, ask for help. Um, community uh, helpers like uh, ANS uh, organizations who are there for small businesses. I think that's a great place mm -hmm. to start. Yeah. Um, Nicholas, you know, it, it's an interesting point Yulima brings up about what should happen next now that we have seen this significant amount of stimulus? And for example, in the U.S., you know, she alluded to the CARES Act, which was like just over $2 trillion in terms of the stimulus package that was passed in the early days. But then we've now gone, you know, three months or so without additional help. And, and you know, if you look at this from a global perspective, how do you view it? On the one hand, you're looking at a massive debt picture and, and what's waiting on the other end. And yet you've also got individual governments who are saying, look, that initial phase worked. And so this is not the time for austerity. More money, more investment needs to be made at a time when these businesses are struggling. Mm. So I think um, it's a really complex situation. Um, and perhaps you can look at the individual actors to work out what I, what I think they should be doing. So first of all, given the general environment, so because we have such low interest rates at the moment, um, the debt, I believe, in the short term at least, is serviceable, but there will have to be um, strong, I think, uh, um, fiscal discipline in the next five to 10 years in order for it to be serviceable and for it to continue to be serviceable. Um, and that's off the back of this sort of extraordinary unconventional monetary policy, which we see happening in nearly all the central banks um, around the world, where they've moved from, uh, you know, controlling money supply and interest rates towards um, just, you know, purely money supply because all the interest rates are effectively zero now. Um, so that means borrowing money is cheap. Um, so governments, yeah, I think the stimulus is fine. It's needed in the short term. I would perhaps question the extent to which it's been targeted appropriately um, in a lot of countries, um, you know, broadly, I think it's 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 done it's done well. Um, I would say, what do we need to do to kickstart kickstart economic growth in a real sustained way? I would say, first of all, we need to invest in new technologies because the technology is going to be the thing which really drives the um, the productivity growth in the next five ten years. So, first of all, yeah. Invest in new technologies. So this is, you know, advanced applications of the internet, decentralization of the workforce, all those sort of technologies. Support and incentivize businesses to adopt that technology because when they're looking for that technology, there'll be a market creator for it. Secondly, I would recommend that governments focus on startups and scale-ups in their procurement strategies. Um, our research shows that government-focused procurement strategies is much more effective than government-focused grant programs for driving innovation. Um, thirdly, we would say governments should consider putting in place some sort of regulatory sandbox, as we like to call it. So what does this mean? So in a lot of uh, economies in the world, there are there is a substantial regulatory burden in a lot of industries, right? A lot, a lot of these regulations are put there for good reason. But what we've identified is that many of these governments can separate some of these regulations into absolutely essential and slightly less essential. And what a regulatory sandbox does is it says, okay, if you're a new business, we'll give you two years where you have to only comply with the most essential regulations and that will ease the burden, allow you to get established. And when you're in a position to be able to finance and um, uh, not be crushed by the regulatory weight, then you can um, uh, adopt the full regulation um, requirements along else. Yeah. Um, Nalima and Jonathan, I, I saw you nodding as he was talking about the investment in, in tech and startups. Uh, do either of you want to on a weigh in on what Nicholas just said about how we should approach the recovery beyond sort of the rescue, the initial rescue? Nicholas, uh, Nalima, do, do you want to go first and then I can jump in after that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> You'll bribe out. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a couple of things to the recovery. 
we're talking about uh, you've got businesses that need help, and I'm talking about small business, and you also need workers to have jobs because unemployment has gone through the roof in most countries. So you need short-term quick fixes and you need longer-term solutions. And some projects, even if you announce them today, they may not get off the ground for a couple of years at least. So that's not helping people in the immediate situation. One scheme they've got going in Queensland, and it's not a new scheme, but I think personally it's a very good one. It's a short, quick fix it situation by creating employment for people out of work. And it, it, the government, the state government provides money to the local councils and then the councils have jobs allocated for people. It might be like a lot of maintenance work, you know, tidy up, paint your bridges, fix up your bridges, tidy up your public places. And I think that's very important because it also makes the place look nice as well. That's a short term thing. And the government had, the state government, government had already put in $800 million just prior to the recent state election. They were, uh, they came back into government. They were re-elected and they have added another $800 million into that project. Now, long term, and this can apply to all countries, I think gov governments, this is not industry, but I'm talking about governments, need to create large scale projects roads, bridges, roads, trains, major, uh, you know, structural, you know, type of um, uh, jobs that we need. That will create long term and seeing that um, interest rates are so low, that is that should not also be seen um, as a cost, but it should be seen as an investment in their country. So they're the, they're the two areas. Now, the now when it comes to um, like Australia at the moment, like a number of countries, is officially in recession, which has been brought on by the shutdown of the economy by government due to the coronavirus. So in my opinion, I believe that it is the responsibility of government in this case, and that is to, uh, to assist as much as possible because businesses didn't shut down. They were forced to, to shut down. And this is probably globally as well. So I think there is a responsibility that government should look at what they can do uh, to assist small business owners in particular because they make up the bulk of business owners. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, for example, it is still the single largest employer in the private sector. So you've got to look at things like that. There are other things that can be done as well, but I'm talking about from the viewpoint of small business in this mm -hmm. country. Nalima, you want to jump in? Absolutely. Um, so in terms of technologies that we are looking at to really strengthen and strengthen our uh, small businesses is really look at digital transformation. Look at ways to take their dependency on a physical location immediately. It's, it's as simple as don't have your servers in your office anymore you know, bring them to cloud operations and stuff like that. So that's a, it's a really smaller and a very simple change that will remove a lot more dependency on a physical location. The second, of course, a medium uh, operation or medium complex businesses should think about how do we build our workforce um, to work from home and strengthen that operation that way. There are tools in, technology, in the technology world that actually helps small business owners um, to really rethink and reprocess their operation using those tools. Um, as simple as monday.com and, you know, uh, simple task based um, using more CRM systems. Uh, take us cost effective. Don't don't have to go to Salesforce. You know there are other options. Um, and then for more complicated and growing and exponentially, um, you know, scaling small businesses. And yes, we will see a lot of those exponentially scaling small businesses because if you're in that industry that's hit by COVID, it's a place where if you're hit negatively, it's probably going to take the company, the small business down. But if you hit positively, if you don't know how to scale, it'll also create the same impact. So we are looking at AI-operated uh, systems that will help 
uh, with not a, having to hire too many people and have the technology help you uh, prepare for yeah there is the business is growing but which area do you want to concentrate right do that uh, data analytics and understand where you're getting more traffic from and really rewire uh, yourself into those tools in those areas mm -hmm. we are definitely seeing more in uh, infusion of ar vr now because we all have zoom fatigue we don't want to be looking at a screen anymore we want to feel an experience uh, and be normal like human beings, yeah. right? Yeah. If, say, for example, we are looking at trainings. I don't want to be training in where my students are always looking at a screen. I want to train in physical environment. We are already looking at ways how can they, they become, um, you know, an immersive experience, right? Yeah. Those are the tools that we need to look at. And you know what? It's the best time of the, of the generation. Um, technology is actually cheap. It's, it doesn't need to be that expensive. If you well, and, and, and to your point about just staring at screens, um, we've heard that a lot from students, right? Yeah. We've been remote learning for so long that it needs to be somehow a little more of an immersive experience. And it feels like that's actually starting to shift a little because of a lot of these startups who have sort of injected their solutions in there too. Um, Jonathan, I know you had a thought on sort of this tech transformation that's happening because you've got a pretty good pulse on these individual countries, you know, how much that acceleration has happened as well. Um, you know, what are some solutions that you've seen that you think have really gotten things right that, that you think points to the direction we're headed in? Right. I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm in supply chain, so so I can speak to those solutions in particular. And uh, to Nilima's point, you know, the small businesses do need to transform and, and that transformation is lasting. I don't think that we can, we will go, be ever going back from that. And the faster that they make that change, the more they'll be able to keep up with with the economic with the economy and, and be able to kickstart it again. Um, and you know, some of the solutions that we see are very much focused on digitizing their supply chains, digitizing procurement strategies, uh, digitizing pricing strategies. Uh, you know, all of that I think is is crucial for businesses to to then start figuring out. Okay, well, how do we move beyond? Um, you know, just selling in, in retail, but then really moving into e-commerce, for instance. And we see this in countries like Indonesia, where companies like Tokopedia have really taken off, and and they've done this pre-COVID as well. But uh, you know, small businesses are very much benefiting from being on such a platform as as Tokopedia, um, and and allowing for for their small business to still prosper. And, and to Nicholas' point. You know of, of sandboxes singapore's done a tremendous job at this right they've done this in, in fintech they've done this in supply chain they've done this in, in trade um and and really building out okay here is a two-year sandbox uh, you know go wild and you don't need that burden and startups really do thrive in that because it, it allows them to kickstart immediately in, in three to six months get a product up and running get some initial customers and, and be able to drive that growth and you know that is probably a critical component to getting us kickstarted again into 2021. Uh, Stanley, do you want to weigh in on this part? I, I know that you have talked about laying the groundwork for the recovery, and you know we're talking about digital strategy here. You've talked about building out the, this this halal trading platform that is very specific to the Malaysian market to be able to help some of these businesses recover. Um, to, to Jonathan's point about having this sandbox, allowing these businesses to, to become more innovative and, and the government having a hand in that. What are you seeing in Malaysia on that front? Well, to begin with, the government is feeding the population with more money from 200 ringgit to 1,000 ringgit a month. That's hopefully will defeat the small businesses, the hawkers, the small SMEs, so that they can survive. That's mm -hmm. one. The second thing we're doing is we're building this trade platform for the small merchants for specific halal products. And we have forgotten that the Muslim market is $4.6 trillion a year. So that's pretty big around the world. And the problem with halal products is in the acceptance of the product as being halal as opposed to haram. So we're building that model so that these products can flow 
faster, quicker in the supply chain. So that's one of the things that we're working on at this moment. Hmm. Um, Nicholas, I, I wonder if we, we sort of like look into our crystal ball here and um, try to move the conversation forward to a year from now where, where we are likely to be. Um, there, there's obviously the, the, the big question mark in the middle, which is, do these vaccines come to market? Who gets vaccinated first? And, and when does business resume the way it was pre-pandemic? Walk me through your your the key risks that you see into getting to that point a year from now. What what do you think are the most significant risks that could stall the recovery? I think there are two significant risks. The first one is that so we have a, a large macro model, right, which helps to do lots of forecasts of different parts of the economy. It's incredibly detailed. And what we've identified over the next 12, 24 months is that unemployment is only going to stay high when business fixed investment is low. And the thing which is causing business fixed investment to trend really low at the moment is that a lot of these businesses are uncertain about the operating environment because they fear that the government could shut them down again. And no business is going to invest when they have that sort of uncertainty that there might be another another lockdown. So I think the first risk is business-related risk. Uh, I think governments need to come up with a better strategy than lockdowns. Um, you know, as an initial measure, it made sense, but I think going forward, we need more specific and targeted approaches to around contract tracing to to deal with the the ongoing threat from the pandemic, and that will give business the confidence to invest in things which will cause the growth. So I think the first one is business risk. The second one is around the vaccine. So um, will the vaccine help us to safely renew world travel? Um, I hope so, but there are risks that maybe the vaccine won't work as effective. There are the risks that a lot of people won't take the vaccine. And um, then there is the risk that even with the vaccine, uh, travel and tourism won't renew to um, where it was you know, two years ago for another five years. And I think that's probably realistic. It's going to take three or four years at least before tourism gets back to the level of where it was. Yeah, oh, look, I tend to agree uh, with what you're saying. Um, and I also think there's another important issue, uh, and that is consumer confidence. Now, if consumers don't spend, that affects small and large businesses. And in Australia, for example, there haven't been a lot of um, wage growth. There has been some, and so there is an issue there with, uh, like, the cost of living is high. The wages in Australia are high, but they're not high enough, you know, for workers because they need to, uh, they've got other costs as well. So it's consumer confidence that I think is very critical and crucial uh, to um, to the retailers and to others as well, um, I totally agree. Um, and that is that would be one of the that would be one of the other stumbling blocks as well. I think, and that is consumer confidence. Mm. And I'll just add to that point, Anne, because it's really interesting. A lot of the stimulus yeah. um, that has been provided by government has actually been saved and not spent, which is quite interesting because um, yeah. Yeah. the same thing happened in the financial crisis around you know, 12 years ago, a lot of the stimulus was saved and we really need that demand pull um, inflation to kick the aggregate, aggregate demand back up. And what do you think it's going to take to, to get that demand up again? If that confidence isn't there to Anne's point, yeah. Nicholas? Uh, it's going to, so people aren't going to spend if they are uncertain of their future um, income. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and, employment, and employment as and well. employment that's yeah. right so a lot of people tend to um, smooth their um their, their spending behaviors over a period of time so they will when they make their decisions they'll think okay I'm I expect I'll have a job and a steady income for the next 24 months therefore I feel like I can make this purchase now but if there's that uncertainty then they're more likely to save their money and how many of the businesses that you work with are operating under the assumption of another potential lockdown? I don't. I don't think it's a, a, a number one conscious thing. I mean, it's like everything else. None of us know. Uh, as I said, we've done very well in Australia, but it has been at a cost. 
And we just hope, of course, everybody, I think, is hoping that it's not going to raise its ugly head again. Uh, it is, uh, I think they've got the contact um, tracing, I think they've got that down to a fine art now. And I think if they can keep on top of that, so when there are pocketfuls of outbreaks, they can contain it and fix it. I think that's that's um, the important thing. But I don't think people are, wor are worrying too much generally about whether it's going to be a another outbreak. It's just I think people are, like small business owners that I know, they're trying to survive. I think that's the most important thing. And, you know, Jonathan, as somebody who deals with supply chains, I am curious if you think that trade will be as as flowing cross-border. The thinking seemed to be, at least in, if you want to say, the initial days of the pandemic, that more and more of these companies were realizing just, just where those borders were because we saw everything close up, where everybody was sort of, every country was kind of fending for themselves too. Where do you think this takes us if we're talking a year timeline from now? Is this acceleration going to continue? Are we going to continue to see demand at least online and is that go is that enough to fuel fuel things moving forward yeah it's an interesting point i think we're, we're st still seeing continuous demand online and, and all you know given that we now have thanksgiving weekend and, and black friday weekend that's over it'll be really interesting to watch the numbers and, and the, the numbers that will come out in the next week about how that week up went um, because i think it's a big indicator and a big early indicator of how people are feeling about it now, in, in a year from now, you know, our expectation is that in general e-commerce and, and digital industries will be doing fairly well and that trade flows uh, across those will be doing fairly well. I think the more, you know, older sectors, the retail sectors, the freight sectors who have been significantly hit, um, those will continue to suffer, uh, you know, as, as long as things like vaccines have not been properly allocated, as long as that distribution flow has, has not been um, you know, properly set up. And, and I think that is the next challenge, right, for, for the next few years, especially for the next six months and next year, that is going to be the real challenge. How do we distribute a vaccine to then allow for people to get back online, to get back into work? Okay, we've got 2.30 left. I see the clock there, but Stanley and Nilim, I wonder if I can get both of you in with the last yeah. word here. Uh, Stanley, well, with you, uh, the key risks or the biggest concern that you have as you look to uh, a year from now, how things are likely to be operating, uh, sort of vaccine distribution aside. Well, I'm I'm speaking about Malaysia. The government is very unstable now. They still haven't solved the problems of previous governments. There's been a backdoor government, so-called a backdoor government, in power today, and that's they're only living on two votes. So. It's it's very unstable in that country. Yeah. Uh, so talking about stability. Uh, yeah, you need stability. So there's no mm -hmm. stability. There's no con consumer confidence at this moment. Yeah. yeah. And and Nalima, the final think, word for you. Um, in the same lines, I think um, you know we know that we won't have the same government we had this past four years and through the pandemic. So we know that those changes will happen. I'm just praying that the new change in political scene would not reevaluate the uh, the process. I think CARES Act, you know, grants and funds that went through don't make too much changes in whatever has already been. Try to make it as seamless as possible. We want to make sure our small businesses, even big businesses survive for us to really get through and get over. Like uh, I believe Jonathan said, administering this vaccine at this point, we may not have a vaccination very soon, but definitely have a vaccine in very near future. How do we administer that? How do we utilize our resources? Really get to work, really get our differences, put our differences aside, work as, uh, as, a, as a country, work as world together and get through this. If we can get through this, I think um, we'll come back, come out a bit stronger. That's the biggest thing. That's a good note to end on. We'll end it on a positive note. Jonathan and Nilima, Stanley and Nicholas, it is great to talk to all of you. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.